Oh, I can go home now and just be so happy. Oh, yeah. My spirit feels so full. Oh, That's what I'm talking about. Now you understand what I've been trying to say. This release, this flying, this, this word, where this spontaneous worship. This, it, I call it prophetic worship. Many call it prophetic worship. Uh, prophecy simply means to speak or sing yes. by divine inspiration. Right, right. Mm. Whether in prediction or simple discourse. Doesn't even have to be. Prophecy is not about prediction. Prophecy is not about something that necessarily shall be. Prophecy can be about what is. Right. Prophecy can be about what was. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, prophecy can, has got an eye back, an eye in, and an eye forward. Those are the three eyes of prophecy. And to sing in this way, to worship in this manner, is prophetic worship. It is about releasing that spontaneous yes. inspiration yes. of the Spirit. Yes. It's not rehearsed. It's not a melody. There are no lyrics. It's nothing you have pre-thought of. It is inspired yes. on the moment, in the moment. All right. Okay, are you all ready? Yes. Amen. You want to hear this? Yes. Amen. Have you been touched? Yes. Have you gained something? Yes. Do you have a new vision of worship? Yes. What? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Praise oh, God. All right. Let's strike out. There are seven prophetic church ages. When John was in the spirit on the Lord's day on the island of Patmos, God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Apocalypse means revelation. And this whole book of the apocalypse or the revelation is all about Jesus. Everything in there is about Jesus. It is about the Lamb. No book in the Bible talks about the Lamb more than the book of Revelation. He is mentioned all the way through as the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. But in this revelation of Jesus Christ, there is the revelation of the seven churches in Asia Minor. These were literal churches in the days of John. They were there. Uh, in Asia Minor, they were formed like in a semi-circle as far as looking down a bird's eye view on a map. There was the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea in that order. Amen. And each one of these churches was also not just about the literal church of that day, but they were prophetic uh, demonstrations of seven ages that the church from its birth on Pentecost until the rapture of the overcoming saints would go through. Yeah. Uh, there have been seven church ages. We are in the last and final church age called the age of Laodicea. Yes. Glory be to God. The first church age was the apostolic church age. The church age of Ephesus. That church was the apostolic church. It was the beginning church. It was the foundational church. It was the church that left the first love. The church that left their first experience. And God warned them, unless you repent, I'm going to take the candlestick away. And eventually it happened. The church went through Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, and finally came to the longest church age period of them all, which was the church age of Thyatira. The church age of Thyatira lasted almost 1,000 years. It was the age of the spiritual darkness called the Dark Ages. It was right in the middle. It was the fourth church. There were three before and three after. But the Thyatira church age, which was the church age when Jezebel ruled, right. it was the church age that God said, Akamahaya, the depth of Satan, right. is in that. Oh. Oh. Yes. It was 
the church age, and I know this makes some people angry, but I got to say it anyway. It was the Catholicism church age. It was the church age where the Catholic church dominated the Christian world. The Roman Empire fell politically, but the Roman Empire was risen spiritually. And they took over the church. They killed the church. They came with all kinds of false doctrines, such as infant baptism. Go on. They wanted to baptize babies before they had the mind to choose for themselves. They wanted to get their name in their books and bring them under their domain or authority. Give me, give them a child from one to five and they will forevermore be a Catholic. Come on. Yeah, amen. Because those first five years are the most, imp the most imprints are put in the minds of a child. Yeah. And so they invented infant baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They were the first church that did away with baptism in Jesus' name. All the apostles baptized in Jesus' name. Yeah. Every one of them. There's not one who did not. I know what Jesus said. We were talking about it yesterday. Blessed be the name of Jesus. About that beautiful, sweet, holy name of Jesus. The name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Brought together in the harmony of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did away with that. They did away with the Word of God. They presented the Word in Latin so nobody could understand. They discouraged anybody from reading anything that they could comprehend from the Word of God. They removed all truth from all of the people. They came up with ideas of, of uh, the uh, papal supremacy. That he was infallible. That the Pope was God incarnate. That he came to this, that he was in this earth to speak as God. Right. And what he said was God. And then they came up with the supremacy of the bishops and the vicars and the reverence. Right. Don't call me reverend. <laughs> there is only one who is reverent. His name is Jesus. There's no other name that is reverent. I'm not reverent. You're not reverent. We barely know what reverence is. Hallelujah. But that's where it started. Calling the hierarchy reverent. Because they wanted the people to bow down. And see the priesthood as something beyond them. Yes. They started teaching about purgatory to fear people into paying money so that they could live high on the hog and build their big majestic idol worship temples. They introduced idol worship. Worship of the saints. Worship of Mary, the mother of God. They put Mary in the place of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You want me to go on? Yes. Amen. Amen. They taught penance. Penance simply means that you have got to punish yourself for the sins that you have committed. They took the cross away. And all the cross they put in front of the people was some gory, disfigured, crucified Christ who in the minds of the people was not alive. Was not resurrected. Was not living to make a way for them into the presence of the Father. Hallelujah. They put the priesthood in the place of Jesus where confession had to be made to the priesthood. Not to my high priest. So that they could say, okay, got to go 20, say 25 Hail Marys and, and do the rosary and, and go, 55, go pay $55 in the box. It was all a means of control. Yes. It was all a means of bringing, all the means of bringing people under a dominance and under an authority through fear and intimidation. Yes. Yes. Amen. All right. Amen. That was the church of Thyatira. Imagine a thousand years of that. 
Imagine the condition of the church when Martin Luther came along in 5, 1517 and he's, he went to a seminary and he started reading the word of God. And he's like, wait a minute. That's not what we teach. Wait a minute. There is redemption through faith. Wait a minute. I only need the blood of Jesus. Wait a minute. We are all priests. Glory be to God. Amen. In 1517, he wrote a 95-page thesis that he took and he slammed on the door of the cathedral in Wittenburg, Germany, Deutschland. And that thesis read, Jesus is my only Savior. of Sardis began. Yes. And to the church of Sardis the Lord said strengthen that which remains yes. Yes. because you're almost dead. The life of the church was practically snuffed out yes. through Catholicism. Yes. They started this thing called the Inquisition yes. where they brought people in who they thought were a threat Yep. to their hierarchy yes. and to their kingdom and if they found that these people believed in the true and the one living God and in the Savior of the world the resurrected Christ they would burn them at the stakes right. they would hang them they would chop their heads off or they would bury them alive right. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh, but there were few at the end of that thousand years who even had a glimmer of understanding of what true redemption was. The church had been buried in all of this dogma. It had been buried in all of this hypocrisy. It had been buried in all of this spiritual death. Praise God, people didn't know who God was. All they knew was that there was a big church. And I had to go to that church. And if I didn't go there, I was going to go to purgatory. Or worse still, I was going to go to hell. Or worse still, I was going to go to outer darkness. You think that spirit is still not rampant in the church today? You, we still have churches governed by that Jezebel dominating, sensuous, false spirit holding people captive and bonded. Oh, somebody shout to the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so the Reformation began with Martin Luther. Oh, was he hated? Because he started to enter, he started to raise up again the candlestick that had been lost and fallen down. He started to bring up, he didn't have all the light of truth. But let me tell you, there were one or two lamps starting to burn on that candlestick. Calvin came along and added a few more. And John Wesley came along and added a few more. And long it's been up to this present day where God's not through yet lighting that candlestick and causing it to told you all about three or four months ago we don't need a revival we need a reformation we need to be reformed reformed hallelujah so Sardis began that church age lasted approximately a hundred years or so hallelujah where the, there was continuous reformation and war between the Catholics and the Protestants. Yes. Protestants simply means they were protesters. Right. 
I am a protester. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Amen. Oh, what religion are you, brother? I am Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I protest that false hierarchy. I protest those demons. I protest that religious spirit. church age of Laodicea, some of the mannerisms of Rome yeah. were never abandoned. Some of the mannerisms of Rome remain deep-rooted yes. in the church. Yes. Yes. One of them being the hierarchy. Oh, yes. yeah. I hate I Hierarchy. I don't belong to a hierarchy. I am a simple shepherd boy with a staff in my hand, with a sling by my side, with a shepherd's bag by my side.
church yes. into Sardis yes. to strengthen that which remains yes. and that is ready to die. Come on. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, you read those seven churches and you look at the messages the Lord gave through those angelic beings or the pastors of those churches uh, and you look at the history of the church age, you see how it fits perfectly including Thyatira, including uh, Sardis, in including uh, Philadelphia. That was the church age. Calvin comes along. Missionaries mm -hmm. started to be sent out. The brotherhood started to be formed. People started to love again, care again, right. give again. And then we came into this age. Right. 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 Yeah. Yes. But in the Reformation, this is where I'm going in this lesson today, many of the mannerisms of Rome were never divorced. Mm -hmm. They carried on through into the present church age, into the present church culture. Yes. Rome was considered the place of entertainment. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. oh, yeah. Does anybody know where I'm going? Yes. Yes. They had their amphitheaters and their coliseums. They had their stages and their performers and their singers and dancers and, and their games and their gladiators. And, and I mean, Rome was known for uh, entertainment. Right, right. And this same spirit spilled over from the Roman secular world into the Roman spiritual world. Where big church amphitheaters, I call them, <laughs> were created with big columns and big stages where the performers were the priests and the altar boys and the crowd was the audience. Yes. 
The audience was never included in much of anything except to say repetitious chants. Right. Right. Yes. Amen. So says the Lord. Hail Mary. <laughs> Nothing spontaneous, nothing living, nothing from the Spirit of God, all programmed. And the priest would say this, and the people would say, and the people say, Amen. <laughs> and the church became a theater. It became a place to go and watch your favorite priest or your little altar boy or to watch the incense. Oh, they had to make incense because they didn't have the real stuff. Sound familiar? Churches today got smoke coming out of the floor and smoke coming out of the walls and lights flashing and things booming. You know why? Because the smoke of the glory of God is not there. So we gotta make it. We gotta have some kind of cheap imitation of God's presence. Just let me have the presence. But you see, the presence of God, the real presence of God, costs something. Come on. Come on. It's not free. You want God's presence? You want his devouring Shekinah fire? There's gotta be something on the altar. Right. His presence, his fire would not fall right. unless the altar had a sacrifice. Right. You think you're going to live a life without sacrifice and have the presence of God in your life? Go join a club because you will get just as much out of it. It doesn't work that way. God's presence, God's presence descends on sacrifice that he has ordered I'm not talking about self-sacrifices. I'm not talking about you deciding, I'm going to give gifts to God so I can have presence. It doesn't work that way either. You seek the Lord and you walk in obedience. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. So this spirit of Rome spilled over into the church where the church became a theater with a stage and performers and the people became the audience. This same Roman spirit is dominant in the church today. I only had to look at this congregation today to see that spirit. I'm sorry. Better you. You say, what do you mean? You're an audience. You're listening to somebody you think is performing. And if they don't perform the way you like, you're not moving. Right. Right. Come on. If they don't sing what you like, you're not moving. Preach. If they don't operate how you feel, you're not moving. You are an audience. That spirit is rampant in the church. And I've been leading up to this for months now, talking about the New Testament church. The measures, the statutes, the capacities, the gifts, the callings. Why? Because God wants His church to be living. He wants it to be active. He wants it to be alive. He wants everybody to play their part. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, shout out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. We don't know. How to spread our wings out. Jesus. We're too busy watching. Jesus. Jesus. Too busy looking at the performers. Jesus. Jesus. Too busy listening whether they're in key. Or in tune. Or doing the right thing. Or saying the right thing. Instead of putting your wings up. Like the cherubims. And letting the breath of the Spirit of God. Take you where He wants you to go. Where we are all active. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if I'm making sense. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Everybody has a part to yes, play yes. in this move of God. Yes. We are not in Rome. God help us to get rid of that spirit Amen. where the stage is the center Hallelujah. of the church. Hallelujah. Where everything that goes on, uh, look, Glory. my wife and I, 
We've traveled a lot, as you all know. Mm -hmm. We've been to all kinds of churches. <laughs> and you walk in the door, some churches you think you were in a nightclub. Mm. Yeah. Come on. Not a holy place. Go on. You would, the, the walls are painted black. Come on. They've got these strange lights go that go to the beat of the drums. They've got dry ice coming out of the walls. Church. Smoke. They've got a cup of coffee in their hands. Right on. <laughs> and the performers begin. Go on. Sorry, but. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. If you missed it, you missed it. It will be edited. Praise God. You got dancers dressed in who knows what. Flaunting their bodies and body parts that they should not be flaunting. See, what people don't realize, what God's people don't realize, that your body is your preacher. The word flesh or body in Hebrew is basar. And do you know what basar means for flesh, for body? It means to be a messenger. It means to preach a sermon. Go look it up. Everything you do with your body, you are preaching. Everything you do with your body, you are saying something. You are saying, you are revealing who you are. Right, right, right. This outside physical flesh is a mirror reflection yes. of who you are on the inside. Yes. Have you ever heard of body language? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> well, we are living in body language. <laughs> you can have a, a person sitting on the front row of the church, and he can be like this. And you know, man, that boy, he's excited. He's with it. He, he's just got it. You can have him with your legs crossed. <laughs> You, everything is screaming at you. They're not saying a word. You go off to the sun and say, Brother, are you okay? I'm fine. But you see, something's wrong. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> but the body language told me everything. That's That's right. Right. Everything we do with our bodies is a message. Yes. The way you stand, yeah. the way you walk, the way you sit. <laughs> Everything. Yes. Hallelujah. I don't know how I got off on that. Go with me to John chapter 4. I know what I'm talking about. Yes. Entertainment. Yes. Church is not a place of entertainment. No. No, it's not. All right. <laughs> Some, I've been to some churches where the musicians are more, uh, are more keen on tuning their guitars than they are tuning their spirits. Yes. I'm not talking about David. David did a fantastic job. If you saw also how he worshipped. Yes, but they are more into how can I look good and sound good? Hello. Then how can I flow in the Spirit? Yes. Nothing wrong with being professional. Amen. God's Word tells us to play skillfully. Yes. Yes. To give it our best. To yes. do the best. To be our best. Yes. There's nothing wrong with the stage in a church. Nothing wrong at all. But when the stage and those on it become the center of the church, right. Right. Yes. it creates a death. Yes. Right. Because it takes the responsibility away from the people. Yes. Right. Yes. All the responsibility is on the performers. Yes. And if they don't perform, I don't move. Go on. <coughs> oh, Jesus. Is anybody in here guilty? Yes. If they don't push my buttons, 
I don't move. You have become a spectator. Right. And not a participant. Right. We have become a dead limb on the body. We're a dragging leg with no life in it. Oh, it's getting quiet now. Come on. We all need this. Thank you, Lord. Listen to what I'm saying, saints of God. Because if we don't get over this hump in the road where we are right now, we're not going anywhere. Right. We have got to learn where God has got us. And get above ourselves. And soar in and soar in the Spirit of God and go where He is calling us to go. It's a place, trust me, you don't know about. Don't be so high in my eyes. Oh, I know, I know all about. No, you don't. We have not come to this place yet. God is drawing us to a height in His Spirit that has to do with His throne room. It has to do with His presence. It has to do with worshiping and learning what worship is. What is worship? What does it even mean to worship? Worship means to fall down. It means to be prostrate. It means to crouch down. It means to give up. Hallelujah. This is worship. You say, well, I can't go down like that. I'm not talking about your physical body has to do it, but your spirit crouches down before the Lord. Your spirit bows down in humility to the presence of God. This is worship. The first mention of worship in the Word of God is when Abram said to his son Isaac, Come on, son, let's go yonder and worship. Yeah. Bowing down his will. Bowing down his spirit. Going to offer up his only begotten son. The act of worship wasn't in lifting the knife. The act of worship was in the yielding in his spirit. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. When God saw that, he said, oh, oh, it's okay. Now I know. Yeah. Now I know. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm in Acts. I'm in chapter 15. Thank you, Lord. Do you know that all through the Old Testament, all through the wanderings of Israel, from Egypt, 40 years through the wilderness, and all the years through the judges and the kings. All that period of time, through the time of Noah, back in Genesis, there is hardly any mention of worship. Hmm. And there is virtually no music. It was a pretty silent period. The period of the law. Do you ever read in the tabernacle of Moses where there was music? No. None. None. Strange. <coughs> there was no... Yes, they danced when they came across the Red Sea. And they came into the wilderness. That's one incident. One of very few. Deborah, she had a song. Moses had a song. Miriam had a song. But music and worship is not something that was prominent. And all that period was also pictured to us of exactly the Old Testament period. But then David comes along. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. David. Come on. My hero. Yes. I love David. Huh. Yeah. And you know what? God loves David so much he called his own son. The son of David. Yes. Right. Amen. Right. He loved David so much he said, My son will sit on the throne of David. Yes. He is the root of David. Yes. He's from the stem of Jesse. Yes. Woo, glory be to God. He is of the line of the tribe of Judah. Right. He is from David. Yes. Hallelujah. He is David's seed. Yes. That's how much God loved David. Yes. David came along. I've told you this many, many times. Let me fast trip here. Hallelujah. And the ark was in uh, Abinadab's house for 70 years. 
70 years. God's people, no presence, no worship. Yeah, they had a tabernacle. They did the law. They did the sacrifices. They washed with their hands. They burned the incense. Oh, they lit the candlestick. They put the bread on the table. For 70 years, they did all of that with an empty, most holy place. No presence. Imagine being so religious that you can do all of that and no presence. Picture of where we are, people. This church age has exactly come to that place where the religious activities are all performed, but there's nothing in the most holy place. There is no presence. The ark of God is in captivity or it's in hiding somewhere. Thank you, Lord. But David comes along and he says, okay, it's not going to happen on my watch. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God raised up that neighbor to set up a tabernacle on Zion. Thank you, Lord. He went to, make a long story short, he went to Abinadab's house and he brought that out through Obedium's house. He finally brought it to Zion. He put it in the middle of that tabernacle. No veil, no curtains, no walls. God's glory seen for all. God's presence to be experienced for all. And David made 4,000 instruments and had 288 singers. up Zion and seeing that massive tent sister that he stretched out yes. there's a great mystery about that sister Ellen was talking to me about the other day about it. stretching out the curtains oh, David, yes. uh, David David already had a tent on Zion how do I know he had a tent on Zion because the Bible says when he slew Goliath he took the spoils and right. armor to his own tent. Come on. Yeah. That's right. His tent. Come on. On Zion. Hmm. And then David said, I want my habitation to be God's habitation. Yeah. And he stretched out his yes. tent. He lengthened the cords. Yeah. He stretched out the curtains. Yeah. He made that tent into this big place. And he said, come on, let's go get the glory of God. And they brought it in, put it on Zion. He put those instruments and singers around. There was no platform. You know why there was no platform? And there was no worship leader either. Because God was in the middle of it all. Those who led the worship and those who followed the worship leaders were all one. They were all caught up together. Yes. There was no audience. Yes. There was just choirs. Yes. There was instruments. There was singing. There was harmony. There was unity. Everybody lifting their voice yes. and giving their song yes. to God. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. That's how Tabernacle of David was. 24 hours a day, non-stop. Harps, psalteries, cymbals, clang, clang, drums, boom, boom, trumpets. Can you imagine the enemy even daring to come close to Zion and at midnight hearing, praise the Lord. Philistines stood at bay. Oh yeah, they fought them all right. But 
and not on Zion. Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, man. I feel like I'm about to upset my skin. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. Jesus. I come on, she Hallelujah. Okay, Acts 15. Come on. Hallelujah. Look what it says. I've read it to you, but I'm, I'm tying it into something I'm going to share with you right now before we close. Verse 16, this is at the great council in Jerusalem when the elders and the apostles and came together to discuss certain issues going on in the churches round about. And after this, verse 16, whew, praise God, I will return. This is a prophecy from Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. And he's quoting this. After this, I will return. And after this, that means after the gathering in of the Gentiles. Okay, that's been going on for a long time. Right. The Gentiles have been called and have been gathered in and God is still gathering in. And the Lord said, after this time, when the Gentiles have heard the gospel, after that time, I will return. Jesus said, my power and my presence will come back to my people and I will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up yes not the temple of Solomon not the tabernacle of Moses but the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David is one of the last end time prophetic words for God's church. I will build this tabernacle among my people again where there will be no stage. Yeah, there might be a stage and there will always be musicians and there will be singers, but it won't be about them. It will be about my presence. My presence will be the center. My presence will be the reason. My presence will be the drawing. It won't be a personality. It won't be a doctrine. It won't be because we sing so good, sound so good, act so good, like we're so great. It won't be because there is a presence of God. There is the One more scripture. I'm trying to hurry. I don't know why I'm in a hurry. Is anybody in here in a hurry? No. Oh, then I'm not going to be in a hurry. <laughs> I'm talking about worship. Amen. Spontaneous, inspired, where the Spirit of God is flowing through you. It's talking inspiration, maybe to you or to somebody else or to the church. It's where everyone is involved in this spontaneous adoration to God. You're so lost. Right. Saints, to, for us to grow, to learn, to ascend yes. into this place yes. of worship is where we start to touch God's throne. Yes. 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 That's where we begin to touch the throne. Yes. And let me show you why. Thank you, Lord. In Revelation chapter 2, and verse, uh, sorry, chapter 4. Is that what I told you? Four. Yes, 4. I said 4. I, I, I said the truth. Yes, sir. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit. See, some people say, oh, that couldn't have been real because, I mean, they were just in the Spirit like that. And, you know, people can't get in the Spirit just like that. Huh. Oh, yes, they oh, can. Yes. <laughs> Oh no, I gotta go through this, I gotta go through that, and I gotta go through a process to get in the spirit. Uh-uh. God started to talk to John and immediately. Yes. Yes. Ah, Jesus. Yes. Oh, don't let me go there right now. <laughs> immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat 
on the throne. And it goes to yeah. describe his greatness. Drop down to verse 7. Uh, at verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne there were four beasts full of eyes. Oh, hallelujah. Before and behind. Prophetic eyes. Right, right. Eyes that go back. Eyes that go forward. Thank you, Lord. They had eyes of prophecy to see what was and eyes of prophecy to see what is. This is how the inspired prophetic word of God works. It doesn't always go to prediction. It goes what has been. Yeah. Hallelujah. What God has prophesied to yourself. Lord, you've done it for me. Lord, you have made my The second beast like a calf. The third beast like the face of a man. And the fourth beast like a flying eagle. We've yeah. talked about these guys. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The four different characters and natures of worship. Yes. We forget quickly though. Right. Yes. Go on. <laughs> well. I'm trying to walk softly. But I don't know if I can do this walking softly. Praise the name of Jesus. We are so quick to determine that my strength is the only strength. And I am a lion. And I am fierce. And there's got to be stomping and snorting and dancing and twirling and shouting because if there's not it's a bad service. <laughs> oh wow. Yes. Yes. Some people's strength is the eagle. And they're like me. I love to soar. I can go in my study and soar for hours and not know who I am and where I am. Go on. Just soaring. Put your wings out. And let the, your wings catch yeah. the breath of the Spirit of God. Jesus. Hallelujah. But there are others who are like that. And if the service is not like that, just flowing in the heights of this. It's a bad service. <laughs> there are others who have the strength of the man. Humility. Weeping. Crushed. To the mind. Hallelujah. And if, unless the service is like that, bad service. There are others who are an ox. Man, we got to plow in the Word. Just get in the Word. Forget all the rest of it. Just get in the Word. <laughs> and unless that's the strength going on in the service, it's a bad service. But around the throne, it was all four. All four. That's right. Yes. And they all ministered in their pots. Right. They're all four in this little church. Yes. Right. Yes. Some of you are lions. And I, Josh is a lion. <laughs> Roaring, snorting, stomping. I want more people like Josh. He's alive. Do you see how he comes out and dances? I couldn't do that if I tried. His legs are like spaghetti. I know. I'm, I'm watching over there like, how do you even do it? There are people like Sister Dodie. She's an ox. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Loves the word. Yes. She'll die for the word. Oh. We have sores. We just love to soar. Yes. We have those who just love to weep. Yes. And all is right. And all is wrong. When it's taken only as that's it. Oh, yes. 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 People, please. I've said this before. I've told it before. I'm hammering it just one more time. God is in diversity. Amen. Yes. 
True unity is only formed in diversity. Yes. Are we all listening today? Yes. yes. So good. Okay, can I read a little bit more and then I'm going to be through? Maybe. So, we read about the first, uh, these beasts, the, the four beasts. Uh, look at verse 8. Listen now. These four beasts were, were the worship leaders. <laughs> They're you, sister. Right. They're the four of you. Well, yeah, actually, there were six of you. Wait, yeah, six. But these four beasts are the worship leaders in the throne room of God. Yes. Look what happened as they led the worship. Oh, I love this. And uh, the four beasts each had uh, of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. So there are the eyes within. We got the eyes back. We got the eyes forward. And we got the eyes in the present. The three prophetic eyes. Hallelujah. They had eyes within. And they rest not day huh. and night. Oh, we're, we're seeing here David's tabernacle. Woo! We've seen constant, continuous, non-stop worship. David's tabernacle was a picture of the heavenly Zion, where the throne of God is, where there is continuous worship around the throne. Listen, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Kadash, which was behind, which is present, and which is to come. <laughs> Prophetic worship. Yes. Prophetic worship of the past. Whoa. Prophetic worship of the present. Yes. Prophetic worship of the future. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And when those beasts, this is the part of love, Brother Ron, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who oh. liveth forever and ever. Verse 10. Then the four and twenty elders sat down on their chairs and folded their arms and listened to the wonderful singing. <laughs> then the twenty-four elders decided to sit on their 24 thrones and become an audience. Now I'm not saying you can't soar while sitting. You can sit, stand on your head, fly in the sky, lay on the floor, do a handstand. I don't care. I don't care your position. I care what's happening with your spirit. Is your spirit dead or alive to the breath to the anointing, to the praise of these beasts or these four prophetic spirits that God sends into our midst to say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne and liveth forever and ever, then the four and twenty elders who were also surrounding the throne, they fall down before Him that sat on the throne and they worship Him. They worship Him. They pay obeisance. They The Spirit of God on the worship leaders. They joined in. They didn't become an audience. They became one yes. with the worship. Yes. Hallelujah. I gotta get that spirit Rome out of the church. Yes. That's right. Yes. That Roman spirit that thinks we are in an amphitheater. That Roman spirit that thinks unless the performers are performing up to my power, unless they're performing the way I want them to perform, I'm not moving. Right. right. Jesus. 
It got quiet. Come on, preach. I feel attacked when it gets quiet. We are all me and you and you and you and you and you. We're all guilty. Yes. Amen. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of waiting for the performer to push a button. I'm guilty. I've done it for years. Being a spectator. And unless the lion moves or the eagle moves, I'm not going to move. If the man is moving or the ox is plowing, I'm not moving. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Glory to your name, God. Glory to your name, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we need help. Yes. They fell down. They worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crown. Yes. <laughs> they cast their reward. They cast whatever they gained by walking in obedience to the Lamb. Oh, I'm not worthy of this. Only you are worthy of this. Yes. Only you, ha. only you are worthy of such oh, honor. Jesus. I can't take glory for myself. What have I done? Nothing. What have I ever accomplished? Jesus. Nothing. He has done it all. It's all by Him, for Him, through Him, of Him, and to Him. Yes. Are all things, Paul yes. said. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Jesus. We're coming to a new day. And I believe once we find this new day in our midst, it's going to be a magnet yes. to draw in people right. who are looking for reality, right. not religion. Yes. They are looking for the reality of God. They are looking for the presence of God. They are looking for something that will touch them and change them. Oh, just wait until next Sunday. I'm going to teach you about the change prophetic worship makes in your life. Oh, wow. If you leave this service today the same you came in, That's a problem. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> stole the words out of my mouth. Ron said, then there's a problem. <laughs> I would say, we have a problem. <laughs> Houston, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> Heaven, we have a problem. If this doesn't ignite a longing in you for closer proximity to God's throne and God's presence, I don't know what will. Thank you, Jesus. Bow your heads with me.